Okay, um, good afternoon everybody or good morning if you are in a, uh, in a morning time zone or good evening if you are in an evening time zone. Um, so this is the latest uh, of uh, Machine Learning for Science uh, seminar and uh, uh, today is uh, my big pleasure to uh, introduce uh, you to Rafael Gomez Bombarelli from uh, uh, MIT. So for those of you uh, who don't know Rafael, um, Rafael um, uh, graduated from uh, University of Salamanca uh, in Spain, uh, um, which is also his hometown, uh, and then went uh, uh, off for uh, uh, a postdoc in Harvard with uh, uh, a pretty other famous uh, uh, person in machine learning uh, for, for, for science, uh, Alan uh, Aspudo Guzik, um, with whom actually also spin off a company um, uh, that uh, uh, took uh, some of Rafael's time for a while. And then finally, a couple of years ago, he just got uh, a position at, uh, at MIT in uh, um, the material science department. So, so Rafael has been uh, uh, very instrumental uh, in uh, quite a large project, uh, which I thought was called the other green, green, energy, green energy project, if I remember correctly. That was probably one of the very large scale uh, project on material science, on material science using uh, machine learning and, and, and high throughput methods. So without any further ado, I guess I leave the stage to Rafael. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Stefano. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is the first talk I've uh, given uh, since COVID times, and you know, feels really great to be back out there uh, in some sense. And so, yeah, like uh, like Stefano says, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking about how uh, we use machine learning uh, in materials. And particularly some interesting uh, developments we've been doing in uh, learning representations and how do we input matter into uh, machine learning systems. And the appeal of machine learning, I think, is going to be pretty obvious to everybody in this community and the appeal of computation. We've seen computation take over many fields. Uh, you know, uh, nobody goes to a travel agent anymore, or, you know, very few people do. Um, you know, recommendation systems, uh, Netflix uh, choosing what you should see. Uh, so we've seen this, you know, uh, invasion of computational approaches uh, to tasks that seem to be exclusive from, for humans. And I've got a couple of uh, images there from games that seem to be untractable to machines that are now, you know, outperforming humans, even through self-play without any external information. Uh, and in our world, uh, we've opened uh, one extra a uh, piece of uh, an extra degree of freedom, which is uh, computational simulation, right? The laws of physics. So how does this look for material design? How do we enable computers to beat human at, uh, at material design, just like they've beaten humans in, uh, in very complex games? <clears throat> and the way I, uh, we see this is that there is this continuum that connects uh, physics-based simulations with machine learning and statistical methods. Um, and I don't want to go through the full list of, you know, the pros and cons, but, but there is this continuum of, you know, how much prior knowledge you have, right? And the prior knowledge from the physics uh, gives you extrapolability, right? It makes uh, you less reliant on training data uh, because uh, physics and laws are very good at inference. You can probably deploy it in a high throughput fashion. Uh, you get as much accuracy out as you put in, uh, but of course, you get as much accurate out as you put in, so it's typically uh, uh, only an approximate solution to the true complexity of a problem, and typically getting the right degree of accuracy is more expensive than one can afford. And then on the opposite on the end of the spectrum, we've got statistical methods, right, which have proven extremely fast, extremely performance. We've seen all these examples, right, of you know recognizing images, labeling images, uh, generating sound, speech recognition. Um, and that's purely based uh, purely on data. But of course, we need, it needs a lot of data, and somebody needs to label that data. That's part of, you know, for us, the folks that populate this continuum means that we can have this interplay of how do we put more physics and more first principle laws into machine learning so we don't need so much data, or how do we put a little bit of machine learning into the first principles so we don't need to infer all the parametrizations uh, in the old way. And the first uh, 
topic that I'm going to touch upon today is representation learning for a crystalline form of matter, for the nanoporous silicates, for zeolites. Uh, for those who are not familiar with them, uh, zeolites are uh, metastable nanoporous uh, materials made of uh, tetrahedral silicon, uh, uh, silica um, that form this uh, well-controlled nanoporous structure uh, that is very effective at catalysis, at filtration. You can have organic molecules that have just the right shape to get docked somewhere, uh, which allows you to control the reactivity or to uh, retain them. So they're used industrially because they're silicates. Uh, I said metastable. I think they're metastable in the um, philosophical sense because the truly stable phase at room temperature would be alpha quartz. Uh, but you can put them in a chemical reactor at 500 Celsius uh, and they hold up, right? These are very robust inorganic materials. And for that reason, they're used all the time in industry when you require this uh, nanoporous control. Uh, there is about uh, 250 polymorphs of uh, these uh, nanoporous materials, these zeolites. Um, so there's 250 frameworks uh, with different pore dimensionalities, different channel dimensionalities, different types of cages. Uh, and depending on the size of these uh, features, one has different um, uh, applications. Uh, in addition to the sort of uh, silicon oxide reference for the framework, one can also uh, substitute other tetrahedral, uh, uh, other elements in the tetrahedral center. So there's commonly uh, aluminum in there, and there is also uh, uh, phosphorus and even gallium in, in some zeolitic frameworks. Uh, but most of the story I'm going to tell about is uh, reference only to the uh, to the abstracted pure silica polymorphs. So why are these guys interesting? Well. There is about 250, like I said, that have been made. So there's 250 frameworks. But when a physicist enumerates all the possible connectivities you could have, you end up with millions of ways uh, of uh, connecting, of making crystals out of uh, four connected uh, silicon oxide centers. And even if you bring in a, a force field, and they haven't done it with DFT, but they've done it with very good force fields for silicates, you bring in a force field, you calculate the formation entity or the formation free energy of all these hypothetical frameworks. Uh, you get hundreds of thousands that are as stable as the one that as the ones that you can buy in a shop or find in a mine. So this is not driven by thermodynamics. It doesn't seem because you know we've got less than one one percent of the possible ones uh, have been made in the lab. So what's driving them? How do we find relationships here about what's uh, driving the formation of these phases? Uh, and like I said, ideally, being able to make these phases on demand could enable completely new catalytic processes. Uh, and this is particularly important in a time where we want to be less reliant on oil as a source of carbon for the chemical industry. And we want to be uh, bringing in new feedstocks. Uh, so having ideally on-demand pore control will would allow us to make on-demand catalysis uh, on depending on what feedstocks come in, right? So if, if it's been a good tomato season, you use the catalyst that uh, process tomato biomass uh, in an extreme example. So the uh, traditional way to make this is to uh, uh, hydrolyze a source of, uh, of silica and then let it crystallize really slowly uh, under hydrothermal conditions. And you know, cross your fingers that the reaction conditions drive the crystallization to a certain polymorphs. Uh, and people have invested a lot of work in mapping completely empirically what conditions get you which frameworks. A more modern uh, and powerful way to make this uh, is to use directing agents. These are molecules that have the right shape to fit into a pore, such that uh, the uh, material will crystallize around the organic uh, and make the desired framework that uh, is stabilized by the uh, lock and key fit between the molecule and the, and the framework. Uh, and then what's uh, getting very exciting lately is that there seem to be controlled ways to intertransform these materials into one another. So there's been more and more examples of uh, either a thermal or pressure treatment or a slightly more aggressive conditions, what's called a 
ADOR, assembly, disassembly, organization, or reassembly, such that you start with one solid material and without going through an amorphous phase, maybe going through a semi-order phase, end up with a different material, a different phase. Uh, and this is what we found particularly interesting. So can we not have to pay for the cost of making an organic molecule, but still get uh, control over uh, phase transformations in these uh, um, nanoporous silica systems? So for this, uh, we set out and we first thought about how to classify uh, uh, these types of, let's call it synthetic relations and transformations. So the first one we identify is a competing phase. That is when you start with your amorphous precursors and they go out and crystallize in two related in two phases. So you end up with polymorphism, you end up with a system that crystallizes in two distinct phases. Uh, in this case, this is uh, FAU is phosphocyte and EAB is a different type of zeolite. So there are times where you run an experiment and you end up with two phases. There's a slightly cooler version of that that's called intergrowth, which is when the two phases uh, are uh, crystallographically co continuous, right? So there is a stacking fault between them, but essentially you have a uh, perfect order in two dimensions and a discontinuity between the two phases in just one dimension. Uh, so you can see here an example of intergrowth for the polymorph A and the polymorph B of zeolite beta. And you can see how there's a stacking fault there where the, uh, the crystal structure changes pace, uh, but the, uh, uh, the structure is symmetrical on the other dimensions. So that's another type of uh, uh, synthetic relation or phase relation between zeolites that we would be interested in exploring. And then there is these two transformations I was referring to. The, the more classical one is recrystallization or seeding, right? So you start with real material, hydrolyze it under thermal conditions, hydrothermal conditions, and something else crystallizes. And the mapping of what you start with and what you end up with is not clear at all. And then the more sophisticated version I just introduced, which is diffusionless transformations. And for folks that are material are familiar with um, uh, martensitic transformations and uh, alloys, this is a very similar idea. This community typically calls this topotatic or reconstructive, depending on how many uh, crystallographic elements have changed between the initial and the last phase, although that's a little bit of a, a, a hand-wavy definition. Uh, so we're just going to call them diffusionless in our world, which is you start with a solid, you end up with a solid without going uh, through an amorphous phase. Um, so, like I said, if you say if you change a few, uh, only a few crystallographic elements, then uh, it's a topotatic uh, phase relation. And if uh, there is a major, a major reorganizational change in the lattice, then you can think of a reconstructive. Although this is, like I said, a bit of a gray line in, in between the two. So, typically, we go into the representation part. Okay, you got this problem. You got all these relationships. How does one explore these relationships? Well, typically, uh, this is a community that has cared a lot about the pores and the cages inside these materials. So they've typically built a representation of these materials out of these secondary building units. So what is there is no first principles reason for these building units, right? Uh, and we will get into that. This is a visually appealing, sort of conceptually useful way to systematize uh, the 3D structure. So, right, you can see uh, these uh, RHO zeolites we've broken into two cages, right? Like the GRC and the OPR uh, 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 polyhedra. So there's these big compilations of what building blocks have gone into the zeolites, and it's good for classifying them. So there, there is this hypothesis that maybe it's also good for understanding what's happening with them, right? So here we go. Uh, there is this Hypothesis, the structural similarity between phases is related with, uh, with the transformations between the phases. Uh, that's what we're going to uh, postulate. And the common building unit community thinks that uh, having these shared building units between the starting and the final materials is then going to be a predictor that these phases will be related. So you got here MTW, MFI, and beta zeolite. And some of them share some building blocks, so maybe there are some relationships between them. And that's you know pretty much the degree of, of uh, um, uh, the 
predictivity uh, that one uh, might seem to get from this theory. So we set out to see what we can do about this. And uh, we got amazing help from the Oliveri group, uh, who does natural language processing for data extraction. Uh, they have compiled a database of more than 70,000 papers that contain uh, information about zeolites. Interestingly, there is a zeolite called whose uh, acronym uh, is DFT. So, you know, they have to be extra careful about that part. Um, but they flagged 500 papers where transformations are discussed, right? So we've got a corpus where a computer has read papers that look like this and found interconversion, right? Found recrystallization, found all the connections between starting and final materials in case of this. So now we can do some statistics. Um, uh, so what you're seeing here, uh, it looks a little bit pixelated in my screen. Uh, the x-axis there is the number of common building units. The y-axis is how often uh, there is that many uh, common building units. And the color coding that we're going to use throughout is green for recrystallization, blue for competing phases, red for diffusion list, and orange for integral. So you can see that, uh, and then uh, gray is just all zeolites in general, uh, all the experimental ones. So you can see most transformations don't share any building blocks whatsoever. Diffusion list transformations and integral maybe sometimes share zero or one or two building units. And in the right hand side, we show the Tanimoto similarity. That's the number of common divided over the total number of features in general. And you can see most of the times there is no common building units whatsoever. Maybe a little bit for integral. Um, another descriptor that folks have thought about is the similarity in uh, intensity. Are these faces, uh, do these faces have similar densities? Maybe that has to, that's connected with that. Uh, well, not really. You can see for recrystallization, we've got about a quarter of phase transitions that don't even follow Oswald's rule and go from denser to less dense phases. Um, diffusion less sometimes go uphill, sometimes go downhill. Uh, and then for the, uh, the ones that don't have an arrow for competing phases and integral, uh, there isn't really a similarity between the, the densities of the phases. Is there a better way to think about 3D? Well, yes, thanks for uh, some people in the, the UK. We've got this SOAP metric. It's a way to represent 3D structure in a continuous embedding uh, from Gabor Sani and, and other folks. Um, and you can see how we start seeing maybe some, at least we see that SOAP captures these 3D uh, building blocks that people had identified visually. It captures them onto a more continuous representation. And this is something that people have found in a number of fields to be very helpful. Uh, and you can see there is this good mapping between uh, density, so the color code there is uh, the framework density, uh, and the uh, clusters that we've uh, shaded in gray are the common building blocks. So, you know, there is some uh, correlations between the way we've interpreted this structure visually, density, and the soap descriptor that captures uh, 3D. Uh, however, we still don't see a lot of driving force. So SOAP doesn't really explain, uh, it's not constant for any class of transformation, right? Like it's always it can change or maybe, or maybe not. So it's not very predictive. So what's, what's left for us to do? So what we're going to do is think about the covalent framework here, right? We're a very uh, graph-minded covalent thinking uh, crowd here. And we're going to try to interpret the zeolite framework as a uh, just a graph. So we drop the 3D features, and we're just going to see which silicon is connected to which other silicon through an oxygen bridge. Right? So that's what these dots represent. The orange is going to be a silicon atom or a tetrahedral center, uh, and the lines are going to be uh, connections through a, a shared oxygen atom. Of course, uh, crystals are periodic, so we need to find a way to cast a periodic graph. So what we do is we take a choice of unit cell. Typically, the, uh, the zeolite association has a reference unit cell. That's where the um, um, building units were extracted from. So in that unit cell, we're going to draw periodic boundary conditions over the graph. So now we have a periodic graph that captures the periodicity of the unit cell 
uh, has dropped the 3D features from the crystal and only retains what we could call the covalent connectivity. And now we can compare graphs. It's very easy to compare graphs, right? We can say that two graphs are isomorphic. If it's very equivalent uh, up to a relabeling of the nodes, right? If everybody is connected to everybody else in the same way, and it's just a different uh, uh, permutation of a node indexing, then they're isomorphic. Com isomorphism is expensive to test, but it's very clear how to quantify if two graphs are isomorphic. Boom, so we set out, I would check how many um, zeolites are isomorphic looking at the uh, uh, reference unit cell, and we already find that there are distinct polymorphs with distinct 3D structures that have the same connectivities. They have the, exactly the same graph. Right? So you can see the GNE, the melanite, and the AFI zeolites, they both correspond to the same periodic graph. So we do this over a data set, and we find out that it is 15 pairs and one trio of isomorphic zeolites. Looking just at the reference unit cell, it's important to keep this in mind because the choice of unit cell uh, determines the graph. So the graph uh, will uh, change if you choose a, a unit cell with twice the, if you choose a two by two by two supercell, then you end up with a bigger graph that won't be isomorphic to a smaller graph. So these are cases where the unit cell contains the same number of atoms with exactly the same connectivities already without doing anything else. And out of these, uh, four share building units and 11 don't share any building units. Um, but what's more important, of these, six have already seen to have experimental interconnections. So you remember, uh, I, I showed all the ways we, had, we could have uh, phase transformations. Well, out of these pairs, six already have uh, experimental, uh, experimentally observed uh, phase transformations that are then driven, seems to be, by the graph similarity. For instance, this is a, uh, I think, a, I don't have the reference there, I think this is a 2016 uh, Angevante Chemie paper uh, where they observed this uh, phase transformation between GME and AFI. And you can see the intermediate uh, phases forming there uh, in this uh, thermally driven process. And it's very hard to see how there could be a, a fast, easy mechanism to drive you from one to the other. But it turns out that according to our uh, metric, these two have the same graph, which means that every atom is connected uh, in the same way at the beginning and at the end, right? The, the, Dance partners are different, but all the connectivities are exactly identical, which means that there might be a low energy path uh, between the initial and the final uh, states uh, because everybody just needs to switch uh, uh, dance partners simultaneously. What about uh, non isomorphic crystal structures? So we've got a great tool to compare two graphs if they are exactly the same, but ideally we would like to compare graphs that are quite similar, but not exactly the same, to see if this uh, approach uh, extends to graphs that are almost the same. So for this, we use a, uh, we need to do two things. First, we need to define a graph metric. So we use that D measure uh, from that uh, paper that you see down there from 2017, where they introduce this very effective metric of graph distance that is relatively fast it recovers isomorphism. So if two graphs are isomorphic, they will have zero D uh, distance, uh, but it's also a continuous metric. So you can have a value of 0.99 for two graphs that are almost the same. And we, like I said, we still need to do one more thing, which is uh, cell matching. We need to have the unit cells uh, be of commensurate sizes, and uh, we need to apply to test all the symmetry operations because the choice of units, uh, the choice of graph depends on the uh, choice of unit set. So we set up a you know, big screen so that to compare two uh, unit sets, we're going to compare uh, up to you know 15 uh, 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 multiples. Right? We're going to make the unit cell up to 15 times bigger, and we're going to uh, compare all the possible choices uh, for the two systems. So we get this variational D measure. We're gonna keep the lowest distance 
for the best matching unit cells for any two given uh, uh, crystals, regardless of uh, what people have decided the unit cells were uh, at the ICA. So we got this metric, right? Key point is going to give us uh, zero for uh, isomorphic graphs and uh, continuous uh, higher values up to completely dissimilar graphs. So what happens? We go out, we take our, uh, on the left hand side, we're plotting a population density for all the zeolites. So how self-similar uh, zeolites are. On the y-axis, we show SOAP, that uh, 3D metric that I had earlier. And on the x-axis, I showed the measure, this graph metric that I just introduced. Now you can see there isn't really a lot of structure there. Most of them are quite similar to each other, uh, and some of them are very rare and very different from everybody else. But there isn't really a lot of signal there. Now we go out to the 500 ex examples we found uh, in the literature. There's fewer than 500 points because some of them are repeated. And it's the same plot, like I said, color by type of transformation, and now look at the zero value of D measure. There is a ton of red points and a ton of orange points there. Uh, there is a couple more red points very close to the axis. And then on the uh, low soap distance, we've got another uh, area high in orange points. So it turns out that uh, this graph similarity is a great predictor of uh, phase transformations and the 3D similarity is a complementary descriptor, a complementary metric for uh, similarity and for transformations. Let's zoom in right there. So we, uh, we blow up the D measure now, we're going up to 0 0.05. So these are very extremely similar graphs. You can find that all the diffusionless transformations ever observed, which is about 20, uh, rounding up, uh, occur between zeolites that have either the same graph or extremely similar graphs, right? There's one exception, there is this LTA IFY, um, which happens at three gigapascals. At about 10 gigapascals, you can convert graphite uh, into diamond. So this is clearly a different mechanism where the extreme conditions is kind of allow every atom to uh, um, connect to each other in a completely different way. But in, uh, the moderate conditions that have been accessed by the community so far, the rule seems to hold. We went out and just checked all those hypothetical zeolites that are out there to see uh, what's uh, interesting for us uh, to make and to suggest people to make. And we find out that uh, many known zeolites have hundreds, if not thousands, of isomorphic but not realized uh, hypothetical counterparts. Right, so you can see there how, for instance, APC, APD, which themselves are an isomorphic pair, have over 500 isomorphic unrealized pairs. So if I were an experimentalist, that would be a good place to start trying. Let's see what's in there that, you know, what, uh, how can we uh, control the pressure uh, and temperature treatment to transform APC, APD into some noble material that hasn't been made yet. And then for intergrowth, this is the other, right? This is stacking fault type of uh, phase relation where you can have a continuous uh, um, uh, transition between two different uh, phases, which is particularly interesting for complex catalysis because you could get a two for one of uh, two catalytic steps in a sequence on the same material. You can see that it either happens at low graph distance or at low 3D distance, right? So your materials need to be either covalently so similar that, uh, that the bond arrangements look the same, or unit cell or, or you know, secondary building units so similar uh, that you can uh, mix and match those building blocks. We also find a 130 pairs of zeolites that are known themselves. Each of these zeolites are known but uh, there could be intergrowth together. So there's a lot of room there to play uh, with uh, discovering uh, new combinations of known phases. Uh, and again, this is a, an experiment that could be done combinatorically and might not require a lot of uh, one-off uh, 
complicated synthesis of organic molecules, which is the slowdown. So like I said, uh, we found out a lot of explanatory power in this representation, right? This, we set out to how do we input matter into a, a machine learning algorithm, right? The machine learning algorithm has been clustering. Here has been a, a low power, low data uh, comparison. And all the value comes from having the right representation that allows us to extract scientific knowledge and scientific hypothesis. And in this case, it's been that graph similarity is the driver for diffusion transformations uh, in these nanoporous silicates and is together with uh, complementarily with uh, shape similarity, the driver for intergrowth and uh, mixed phases. What's next for us? Well, I yeah, know okay, it. should be okay now. Cool. So, like I was saying, right, we've got two degrees of freedom to represent. We've got a sequence degree of freedom of what I mean, what monomer we choose at a given position, and the chemical degree of freedom of what chemistry we use for each monomer. So the chemistry we're going to represent by borrowing for the from the fingerprints that the chemoinformatics community uses. These are well standard ways of creating a one uh, a bit vector from a chemical graph. Essentially, every atom gets a set of features, atomic number, uh, charge state, and those features are updated uh, based on their first order neighbors in the first convolution, which results in more complicated features based on the, all the binary combinations. And then a second convolution gets uh, reaches out to the third order combinations. And then we pull all that information into a single bit vector. It has proven very effectively in uh, chemoinformatics to do structure property prediction. So now every monomer is a code bar, a bit vector. And now we're going to put a sequence of bit vectors together. So that's how we're going to represent uh, the chemical degree of freedom and the sequence degree of freedom. Uh, and of course, there are very good learning structures uh, uh, that have been made to look at this type of structures, right? Like this looks like a, a, uh, a lot like a one dimensional image with a lot of channels. Uh, and in case you really worry, you know, just to test how much of the long range interactions between uh, 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 between amino acids matter, we can also make a, a unfolded uh, representation that has all the off-diagonal elements, right? So we can represent what's on the diagonal as a sequence, and all the off-diagonal elements represent every possible uh, side chain interaction. And this would be a very, uh, this would be the starting place of what they call transformer models, right? We don't have enough data to do transformer here with 600 data points. And we do have enough data to test some of these representations. And for instance, uh, one of the things we can do with a representation is uh, get a metric, just like I described earlier. Um, we, because we can do Tanimoto distance over the chemical fingerprints, we can now compare peptides that contain artificial amino acid, which has been a, a block. Typically, peptides are compared based on the evolutionary statistics of their component amino acids. You know, tryptophan is very rare, so it's typically evolutionarily very expensive to put in tryptophan anywhere. Uh, but chemically, it might be very similar to tyrosine, right? So we want a metric <clears throat> that quantifies the chemical similarity between peptides, the, between uh, these middle molecules we're making. So on the left-hand side, uh, we're plotting the uh, similarity between our chemical building blocks. You can see there is a very rare building block there, proline not like anybody else, uh, and our uh, one, two, three components are actually quite similar to each other. And on the right-hand side, we're comparing all the peptides. And you can see, for instance, just from a single shot, uh, that we made a combinatorial library. You can see all the building blocks that were shared, right? like uh, all these self-similarity uh, blocks are the modules that are shared between every peptide in the library. And then the peptides one to 50 are the ones that uh, were made uh, sort of based on intuition, based on what's out there in the literature, and span a way more diverse, but much smaller training data. Okay, we've got a metric, we've got a reasonably diverse set of data, and reasonably abundant. So we go train a predictor, uh, and the predictor that we train um, 
uh, is actually pretty effective, right? We try a bunch of things, and at the end of the day, because of representation looks so much like a like an image, a one D convolution worked the best. So we've got a predictive algorithm that, given a unseen pe a peptide, predicts the uh, cell penetrating efficacy measured in a robust uh, single experiment, right? So all the peptides were tested by the same people over the same cells in the same lab, and that reproducibility is what enables uh, these uh, efforts. When you try to do this with open source uh, access data from all the journals, from all the papers, it doesn't work because everybody is testing in a different way. So we train this predictor, and uh, you can see, for instance, in the A plot there, in the first example, we got an accuracy of 90%. So we got about 10% error, 10% uncertainty in the predictions. The metric is the uh, increase over non-assisted uh, delivery, right? So one would be delivering with the raw drug, with the raw PMO, and this is how much boost we get from the uh, adding the peptide, right? So you can see uh, that our training and test data go all the way up to 20. So we can get up to 20x increase in the therapeutic ability of these materials um, uh, so far with the way uh, humans have explored the space. So what we do now is to set up a automated exploration of the, of the space, right? We've got a predictor, we've got a, a machine learning model that gets us from a structure to property. Uh, we care mostly about property. The experimentalists uh, care about a couple of other things, like, you know, let's make it as short as possible so we don't need to wait a lot for the machine to print it. Let's try not to have a lot of charge because we know cationic peptides can be toxic. And let's try to make it novel, right? So we put in a similarity metric. Now that we have a metric, we can use it to move away from known areas. And we set up a genetic algorithm, like a simulated annealing search, uh, so that the algorithm will pull one of those mutations, apply it, and if there is an improvement, it will keep it. And if there is not an improvement, maybe it will keep it if it's not too bad, uh, based on this uh, score, right? So maximizing intensity uh, and minimizing a couple of other properties that the uh, experimental is doing. We set this machine running. It, it takes you know no time to run a genetic algorithm uh, over up to length 80. And we end up with a, a bunch of predictions uh, we made hundreds of predictions. They're all unique, right? They're very distinct to each other because we try to drive uh, with similarity. Uh, we try to drive it away from known areas. And then they got made and tested. So what am I plotting here? The blue, po sorry, the green points are the validation, right? The completely new peptides predicted by the machine. And you can see they're all way better than the best, uh, except for the uh, negative control, they're all way better than the best one that has been made so far by hand. Of course, the model gets very noisy because it's extrapolated by a factor of two, or almost three X. Uh, but all these peptides are way better than what had been done. And on the right-hand side, we're plotting the uh, whisker plots of how they compare with the training data over uh, therapeutic ability is the first one, right? Increasing drug delivery. So they're all better than the training data in length. Some of them are shorter, some of them are longer, some of them are average, just like the training data. Uh, arginine count. It's known that arginine is, uh, enhances uh, delivery, but enhances toxicity too, so we want to keep it under control. Again, we're right there with the training data, and so is the net charge. So all the physical chemistry features of these peptides are the same as the training data, but the model has found what the right sequences are to make this model. And uh, my last uh, uh, slide on, on, uh, on the science here is that uh, we can also do attribution or interpretation. Uh, there is this uh, tool called a, a gradient class activation, GradCam, that allows you to take the derivative of the uh, output with respect to the input in a neural network, such that you will get a high positive values for the uh, those features in the input that are related with higher outputs, right? So that's exactly what we did. We looked at what fingerprints, what chemical fingerprints, and what uh, chain positions 
are related with the high activity of the peptides we predicted. And the beauty of the chemical fingerprints is that they can be interpreted as chemical substructures. So you can see that in that big uh, 2D plot there, we're plotting what fingerprint bit vector at what sequence element was activated. And you can see that the model lights up very close to the end, to the tail end of the peptide, which is great because on the other end, we're attaching the payload. So it's hard to think that that's doing something very specific because it's kind of occupied by the payload. So the model doesn't really care about that length, just it needs it to be long to be able to change the sequence somewhere else, but it's not paying attention to what's put in there. But the model cares a lot about what's put in at the tail end of the peptide. And even more, it cares a lot about two specific elements there, which are the non-natural amino acids. The, the chemistry that drives the properties of the system the most is the amino acid that nature doesn't use. Uh, 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 hexa-amino-hexanoic acid. So that's an artificial monomer that we get to use, but nature doesn't have in its own tool set. And according to the model, having amino-hexanoic acid is what drives properties. And we can also see what chemical features of amino-hexanoic acid drive the properties. And it's actually the oily uh, alkyl chain that uh, 140 to an uh, element in the fingerprint that is connected to the long alkyl chain is the key driver for performance. So we managed to get a model that predicts performance, that it works, that it gets validated uh, in the lab, uh, but also that we can run backwards and interpret in terms of both the sequence, what part of the sequence representation was driving the performance, and what type of the chemical representation was driving the performance. Um, so um, I'll stop here and make sure that we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, what's what's in, the, in the books for us? It would be connecting these with autonomous experimentation and synthesis planning, right? This peptide synthesis is very automated, so you could imagine how uh, this type of regressors would also work for how to make a peptide such that you can A, include that in optimization algorithms, but also B, execute it in the lab, right? You could connect a machine that decides what to make, makes it, uh, and starts again on its own. Uh, so lastly, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, like I said, this is the first post-COVID talk. Uh, I want to thank the team, the two lead authors for the two chunks of science I've presented are Daniel and Somesh, uh, and our collaborators that were absolutely instrumental in getting this science done, were the Pentelute lab in chemistry for the peptides and the Oliveri lab in DMSC for the zeolites. Thanks, Stefano. Uh, let me... Thanks, Emilio, Rafael. Um, so... So I guess uh, uh, this is uh, the kind of the awkward moment of this uh, uh, online seminar because nobody's clapping, but uh, we're just virtually clapping, I guess. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, I do apologize. There were quite a, a number of issues with a resolution here that I couldn't solve. So um, I'm sorry for people watching. Uh, today the quality, unfortunately, was not great, but um, I'll try to fix it uh, uh, for next time. So I guess we have... Time for some questions. Um, maybe uh, since uh, so there's a little bit of a delay, so I'll just I'll just kick off with maybe maybe a couple of questions. So maybe the first one is is about this graph representation that you mentioned for the zeolite. And um, am I understanding correctly when you when you now introduce your your D matrix? Uh, now the issue of comparing different type of unicell goes away. Am I am I understand correctly? So we make it go away. Uh, the the D metric uh, D measure itself uh, is sensitive to the size of graph, right? So it would be sensitive to the choice of unit cell. So we do a variational loop outside of D measure, which is trying uh, all the uh, common multiples we are able to enumerate of the two unit cells. So ideally, they're close in mass, right? So they're close in atom count. Uh, so, you know, uh, we can match them. So it's a extra loop that we need to do outside because, uh, like I said, casting a unit cell to a graph 
uh, you know, different unit cells for the same system will give you different graphs, uh, which we, we mean, it means we need to choose uh, different ones. There's no translational, it's translationally invariant. We don't need to worry about translational uh, degree of freedom. But we do need to worry about um, uh, other symmetries. So essentially, if I understand correctly, you need to you construct multiple of the two cell, common multiple of the two cell, and then you compare those multiples. Essentially, that's the way exactly. around. Ah, okay. And uh, I just wonder. The, the other question is still about uh, uh, now. I just wonder whether can you use? Uh, I mean, can you map uh, when you have a transformation between two polymorphs? Can you map uh, and the, the, the D distance across the transformation. I guess what I'm saying is, can you use this, this distance criterion as a sort of criterion to drive what is the reaction path, if you like? Uh, we're exploring how much of that we can do, but, uh, but the answer is that it's very hard because at the end of the day, the reaction, sort of, if you think about the transition state, it's either fully connected, so it's connected uh, with the superset of the initial and the final connections. If you sort of increase your threshold, right? At the end of the day, who's connected to whom is about a distant threshold, right? How close does that silicon need to be to an oxygen uh, to be connected? So if you set that threshold low, the transition state will have no connections, right? So it will be just atoms floating. Or if you increase it, then your initial and final states will be overconnected. So it's not clear how to do it in this way. We've been thinking, you know, maybe you can have uh, some uh, graph neural network that decides who's connected to whom. Um, but yeah, I think I think the uh, the symmetry considerations are going to be important more than the the graph considerations, right? To have all the atoms occupy the same uh, lattice sites in a uh, symmetric uh, supergroup. Uh, like we did here for APC and APD, right? Fortunately, I mean, they're in the same group, subgroup. Uh, one is PBCA and the other one is PCA21. Um, but even these, right, for this kind of simple system, turns out that it doesn't look like this is a Martensiatic transformation after all. Like it's diffusionless, mm -hmm. but it piggybacks on having water in the pores to kick start the covalent uh, chemistry, chemical reactions. Right. And uh, okay, so I, okay, there are people clapping, but I don't see any questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe um, I'll, I'll ask another one myself. So I mean, you mentioned that uh, um, you extract the data with this uh, uh, kind of natural language process. So can you can you give us more detail of um, how much data you extract and what what exactly did you extract from there? Yeah, so this is the part that uh, the Oliveri group uh, mm -hmm. did. And they've done this across a number of domains. They've made an NLP processing pipeline, and they've, uh, which is challenging. And they've struck agreements with all the publishers, which is, I think, equally challenging. <laughs> uh, so they have machine-readable versions of a lot of published literature. Uh, so they can download all these papers. They can you know, look for keywords. And then they can do sophisticated analysis. And they've mostly focused on um, synthetic recipes. So a lot of the platform is geared to extracting, you know, this was a meal in the presence of that under this atmosphere. So extract all these tokens for all these operations and keep track of, you know, what material underwent all the processes and connect synthesis to outcomes. So this was a, a little bit of an extension to the way they typically work, right? These transformations are not exactly synthesis, but they also look like synthesis to some degree. So they, you know, found out these 70,000 papers about zeolites, and of these, they found about 500 that, you know, have transformation-like statements that describe, you know, A was converted into B through a topotatic process. Yeah. So that, that thing would get flagged, and then their code would extract essentially a table of starting material, final material, synthetic relationship, right? So that's that was the outcome of 